I'd love to have you tell the story because we were at a conference just three weeks ago when you were sharing about how you got into this space. Mm -hmm. Could you give the audience an intro into that? I started in a very entrepreneurial home. Mm -hmm. My Neither parents had a high school education, but my dad ended up teaching engineering for the Navy. So, But we lived in a little small house between my mom's beauty shop, my dad's car lot. We owned orange groves. And I swore I would never be an entrepreneur because we had rental properties that I had to go scrub out the bathrooms between tenants. I was going to become a professional, right? Mm. And I got my degree in accounting. I was one of the very first women in public accounting in Atlanta, Georgia. I was hot stuff, boy. (laughs) Young, single, making good money in Atlanta. You know, it was perfect. Had a great time. But I found myself working really long hours. And Mm. so about the ripe old age of 25, I said, this is kind of crazy. All of a sudden, my parents looked a whole lot smarter. And that's when I left public accounting and I started my entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. And I I really haven't looked back. I started a woman's magazine and sold it. Then I started the the children's talking book industry, the books that have the sound strips down the side. Back that was back in 1987. Wow. Before the internet, before kids had electronics. And we said, how can we get parents to trust us? And so we aligned with Disney, Warner Brothers, Sesame Street, Marvel Comics, and allowed us to really explode that company around the world. And I learned so much. And there's nothing like actually hands-on business experience. Right. And we sold that company in 1991 and moved here to Arizona. And in 92, our oldest son went off to college in, in September and came home in December and credit card debt. We didn't even know we had credit cards. He got to the campus, and there was a table that said free pizza, free money, another one that said free T-shirt, free money. And um, he had a really good time his first semester in college. Did he buy a lot of pizza with those credit cards? <laughs> what was he buying, do you know, to this day? Have oh, he looked? had a girlfriend in a different town. Oh. So that might explain a few, fill in a few of the blanks. Okay, but, that makes um, sense. But he came home in December and wanted to um, have us bail him out, and we did not. Mm-hmm. We always have not I was, haven't always made the right parenting decisions, but that's when I dedicated the rest of my career to financial literacy, financial education, and entrepreneurship education. Mm-hmm. And today, he's as dedicated to that as I am. Mm-hmm. So I'm very proud of him. Fast forward a few years, I met Robert Kiyosaki. He had gone to see my husband, who's an intellectual property attorney, to patent this idea he had for a board game. And Mike introduced us. And I was the only one that got out of the rat race at the first beta test for the cash flow board game. And I loved the idea. It was exactly what I was teaching. The importance of assets, my favorite Mm. word, assets. Buying, building, and creating income-producing assets. We're taught in school to chase money. Yep. Exchange your time for money. Mm -hmm. I was raised in an environment, didn't realize that people didn't get this to buy, build, and create income-producing assets, and that's what creates financial freedom. And so I love the game concept. He wanted to charge $200 for it. I said, maybe you should write a brochure with a philosophy. And that brochure was a little book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We had no idea it would take off and explode the way it did. And we ended up in over 100 countries, over 50 languages, and that was the first of 15 books that we wrote together. And that was... 10 years later, 1997 to 2007, I made the decision to leave Rich Dad. And that's when um, I got the call from President Bush. So I served on the first President's Advisory Council for Financial Literacy. And I share this story, Natalie, because sometimes you have to close one door Mm. for other doors to open. And so viewers and listeners, sometimes I challenge you, is there a door in your life you need to close so other doors of opportunity will open? How do you think you know that when you're supposed to close one and let another one open? Right here. Mm, your In gut. your gut. You keep getting those little taps on the shoulder. For several years, I would get up in the morning and go, is today good for Sharon? Is this staying in this company good for Sharon? No, but are we still making a positive difference? Yes. Uh-huh. And then when he really wanted to go into franchising for the company, which was a great plan for us financially, but it wasn't a good plan for the franchisee, that was finally... The day where I said, okay, we're not, that's not a good plan, and mm-hmm. I can't stand and support that anymore. It made me pull the trigger to, to leave the company. Were you wishy-washy about it at the time, or were you like this gut feeling? Is it 100% certainty and confidence that this is no longer the right door? I need to shut this to move to this next thing. The wishy-washiness was the stress of 
having built this company, Mm -hmm. I was the CEO and the co-founder. We were equal partners. And it was hugely successful. And the brand was very strong. And for me to just step away and walk away from it was a huge decision. But it was I never regretted the decision to to stand in the truth, Mm -hmm. stand in what was good for me, Mm -hmm. and to walk away from a situation that had become not a a good um, situation personally. Our relationship had kind of soured. Because yeah. when, when you make a lot of money, uh-huh. it just brings out more of who you really are. Mm. And we had kind of gone in different directions. And at that moment, I know we're going to talk about Exit Rich a little bit mm-hmm. later, but uh, at that moment, was there confidence that you could exit? Was, was that set up in a way that you were very clear as to what this was going to look like and how to structure out of it? Yeah, it should have been very clear, okay. but it wasn't. Okay. Um, we were very amicable for the first 60 days, uh-huh. and then the valuation of the company came in, uh-huh. and he was like, no way am I paying you that kind of money. Mm-hmm. And so we ended up in litigation for a year, but we settled mm-hmm. in October of 2008, and um, it was the right thing. Sometimes you just, you know, a lot of times people don't stand up for their own rights. Mm-hmm. Brian always tells me people only fight in two occasions when there's too much money and when there's no money. Like right. the in-between, the build, there's not a lot of arguments. Yeah, but some of the greatest stress is when there's too much money. Yeah. Success can bring discontent. And that's why you know, I teach people, plan the divorce before you plan the marriage mm-hmm. because both of you are together, you're excited about the future, you're looking forward, you love each other, you love the concept, you're so excited about what you're going to create together. And that's the time when you say, you know what, in five years, maybe one of us isn't as excited. Let's talk now about how we separate and do it when we are not high emotion, because high emotion, low intelligence. Yep. And so do it when you're setting it up so that you can create it. And that's, you know, that's another passion of mine is why I was so excited about writing Exit Rich. And the fact that you really have to structure and have that plan for how you're going forward.